Hey there, my name is Austin Trammell and I get to serve as a campus pastor for Salty Church in New Smyrna Beach, Florida. And this is where we worship every Sunday morning at 1030 a.m. inside of our local YMCA. And I am so excited you've joined us today at Salty Church Online. To kick the morning off, I have a question for you. How often do you struggle because of poor decisions? I know I do from time to time. Uh, and we want to help you process through that. So this week, we're going to talk about how God wants you to break out of old patterns in order to experience more. So let's go ahead and experience some more. Hey there, everyone. Welcome to Salty Church. Would you guys stand? If you're watching online, we want to welcome you. And we want to welcome you here in person as well. Let's worship together. Here we go. Come, let us bow at his feet. He has done great things. Come on, don't you believe that? See what our Savior has done. See how his love overcomes. He has done great things. Oh, he has done great things.
to sing about the victory that we have through Jesus. Come on, sing the weapon, maybe. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. And when the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. And my God will never fail. We declare, no, my God will never fail. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. And I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Sing there's power in the mighty name. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. Every war he wages, he will win. And I'm not backing down from any giant. I know how this story ends. I know.
We just want to declare in this moment that you're good and that we're so thankful that we have victory in you. Come on, sing, you give life. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that
that was some great worship. Thank you for being a part of that, and thank you to the worship team for making that possible. We're so excited to continue in our worship today, to continue to experience more, and to see all that God has to offer for us. A huge announcement to make today is Easter is coming up April 4th, and we are so excited about it. You can go to salty.org, click on the Easter banner, and sign up for any of our Easter services. We will have a Salty Church online option that day at 9 a.m. on YouTube, Facebook, and salty.org. You can also visit one of our outside and inside venues that we'll have on Easter Sunday. They'll be in Flagler Beach, Ormond Beach, and New Smyrna Beach. So if you go to salty.org, click on the Easter banner, you'll see all of the options there. It also gives you the opportunity to RSVP to these events, which is gonna help us create a safe environment for you to worship freely in with you, your family, and hopefully with some people that you've brought with you that you've invited uh, leading up to Easter. So we're gonna go ahead and transition into our connection time. This is your opportunity to go check out salty.org, fill out a connection card, RSVP for Easter. You can also submit a prayer request there that we're gonna be praying with and for you through that. This is also a good opportunity to take part in communion, maybe find some uh, bread or juice laying around the house and remember the sacrifice that Jesus has made for you. It's also an excellent time to give, to give to the mission to rescue and empower. Last week, Robbie talked about in Ephesians chapter three that being active in God's mission connects us to his power, his more for life. So don't miss that today. If you feel so led to give, you can do that at salty.org and help us continue in the mission to continue to experience the power of God and the more of this life. Thank you for giving to make it possible for others to experience that power. We're gonna take a break for just a moment and then our lead pastor, Robbie O'Brien, will be back to continue in our series, More. Welcome to Salty Church. I'm glad that you guys are here. That's me, Robbie, Robbie O'Brien, and I get to help lead. I'm excited to have you join us. And I want to say, hey, everybody who's watching us uh, via video, uh, to all the coolest people on the north end of the county, welcome Flagler. 
and all the coolest people on the south end of the county, welcome to Smyrna. And then all of the folks here in Ormond, of course, welcome to Salty Church. And uh, everybody else who's watching online, it's really cool uh, having influence as God has uh, really blessed us. And so this is uh, good to have you. And uh, as we get started, uh, I got I got bad news and good news for you, all right? So and I'll just give you the bad news first. And you, you probably shouldn't start it like a talk with bad news, but it's going to be real. Bike week is just getting started. So it's just, you know, see, some people love it and it's like, yeah, it's your favorite time of year. That's cool. I'm glad you, you're excited. But some of us are like already tired. The good news is we're going to make it to the end. It's going to be okay. We got it, right? And in fact, that's a little bit of why we're here because uh, in our study on the book of Ephesians, the theme of which is more, not more stress, not more bike week, not more traffic. It's not about that. It's about more from God, more blessing, more provision, more power. And that's what we've been doing. So we're studying the book of Ephesians and each week highlighting a different part out of each chapter. Last week was chapter 3. And I focused a lot on uh, verse 15, I, and where Paul is, has a prayer for you, and he says, I pray from that his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with strength through his spirit. I don't know about you, but I can use more strength, especially during bike week, because I get frustrated with the traffic thing. Uh, but, you know, bike week comes and goes. It's temporary. We all have struggles. Bike week's probably not a real problem. But we all have real problems and struggles. And I need, and I'm assuming that you probably need more of that as well. And so this series is about that. How do we tune in with it? And then last week I talked about how to really apply that, how to really connect with this. And in my mind, a lot of it really lands with the idea that as we invest ourselves and with the things that God is passionate about, when we're, when we're joining God with what he cares about, he is happy to continue to provide from his unlimited resources so that we have the strength. And we begin to, and as we do that, we begin to experience more. So it's like some of the application of that was, um, oh, I talked about Dominican Republic and we're going to start doing trips. And as a way of exercising our faith so that we can experience more, we talked about, you know, you're one. On all of our campuses, we have props where you can write your, uh, the name of your one, that one person you're helping to follow uh, Jesus. And we do that because as we join ourselves with what God has called us to do, then we connect with the resources that he wants to provide. So that's where we were at out of uh, uh, Ephesians 3 last week. Of course, we turn the page, we go to Ephesians 4. Now, I don't have time to do a uh, a word-for-word kind of thing in there all the way through, so I'm going to start off in verse 17 and and, and really look to see really what I I feel like stood out to me this week as I was studying Paul's letter um, to to the the people in in Ephesus. And I'm going to start on verse 17, but i got to warn you, uh, I am using contemporary English version on this one verse, and i got to tell you because it's a little salty, So you might, and I'm talking like sailor salty. Uh, the language there is a little like, it might catch you off guard, but I, I wanted to do this on purpose. I think it'll, it'll grab your attention. This is Paul, as he's talking really to uh, people like us, he says this. As a follower of the Lord, I order you to stop living like stupid godless people. <laughs> I was like, that's a little salty for a Bible verse, I think. Um, uh, but yeah, it's a little hard. Now, um, you know, when I look at, when I'm studying scripture, a lot of times I'll use some different tools like Blue Letter Bible, and I'll pull up like four or five different translations of a verse. Um, you know, different people will read the Greek and then translate that into a certain kind of verbiage. And so, you know, and you compare those, you really get a good message out of that and understand it. And this really just stood out at me. And I was like, well, do any of you know any stupid godless people? <laughs> You've probably seen a few, right? Not that you hang out with them all the time, but you've seen it, and you know what they act like, and I'm sure none of you are acting like that, right? Probably not. But Paul feels like it's necessary to kind of speak to us as believers, like he's talking about, you know, as he is a follower of the Lord, I'm telling you, and he's writing this to Christians, don't be like them. And we kind of know that, but... He's, you know, he's, he's like, hey guys, let me, let me talk to you about this. I think it's important. And so Paul starts out there, and I wanted to really dig into that a little bit. Uh, let me just give it to you in a, from a, with a little bit of a different vocabulary where you might normally read it like this. Paul's writing, so I tell you, 
and I insist on it. So he's got some really strong language where before he was like, I order you. In this case, he's saying I insist. That's how we might read that Greek a little differently. I insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do. Gentiles are really symbolic of those who were from a secular mindset, non-believing type people in that culture, uh, you know, a long time ago. I, or, you know, I order you, I insist that you quit living like them in the futility of their thinking. So instead of saying stupid godless people, he softens that a little bit. I urge you, you know, it, it, it's just this idea that really stuck out at me, this futile thinking and the futility of their, like just really broke stinking thinking. That's maybe another way of saying that, right? So I urge you, I'm telling you, I just want to encourage you not to live like they do with their stinking thinking. They're futile, flawed thinking. And so that's where I want to spend some time today as we consider what it is the, the more that God might have for us. One of the things that keeps us from more is, I mean, we have these like blind spots sometimes. We, we have a mentality or an understanding about things that just really is broken and flawed. So what is that? And if we can understand that, then we can begin to experience more. But let me just start with this flawed thinking thing, this idea of having blind spots in your life, we've all had them. Like if I were to ask you to think back in your past, was there ever a time in your life as you think back, you were like, oh, I don't know what I was thinking, right? you like, you can look back, you probably have made maybe one or two bad decisions in your life or three, right? So we've all had some things and some of it is serious. Sometimes it's a little silly. I'll start off with one of mine just to kind of help you get started flawed thinking maybe. So it goes like this. Um, years ago, uh, we had one of my daughters was in a gymnastics class. You know, you should, I take her, drop her off. She does these practice competitions, all cool. And I, I used to go and kind of like check that out. And I was always intrigued with gymnastics and all that. And, and, and after being there week after week after week, you know, I got to thinking, you know, hey, it might be cool for me to take a gymnastics class. I think I'm going to take a gymnastics class. And immediately you're like, well, that's weird. Well, first of all, let me just tell you, I'm not joining a kid's gymnastics class here. It wasn't, that was like creepy kind of stuff. No, there was an adult class for gymnastics. And you're like, I, you know, most, you're like, I get it, but I'm just telling you my mindset here because, and let me give you my rationale, um, at the time, and I still do um, CrossFit, have been doing that for years. And in doing CrossFit, there's one or two certain kind of gymnastics type things they do that always give me a hard time. One of which is muscle ups. Muscle ups is um, you got a bar or some rings that you got to grab overhead and you got to get yourself to here, right? Piece of cake if you're a gymnast, but it's really given, it's always, has always and still gives me a hard time. So I think, you know what, I'll take a gymnastics class and then I'll be able to do that. Because if you turn on any kind of gymnastic anything, they all do that stuff really easy. And I can't do it, so I'll take a class. So I signed up, and I go to take this adult gymnastics class, and then it was a little weird because I was the only one there. Go figure. <laughs> so it was weird, but I, you know, I've got, I've got a task I want to do. So, uh, so in my head, I'm like, you know what? You know, you go, and she's like, well, what can you do? I got this, you know, young 20-something coach. She's like, all right, well, cool. what can you do? And she's trying to give me some assessment. What can you do? Because I'm telling her, I want to learn how to do muscle-ups. She goes, that's fine, but you need to do the easy stuff first. I'm like, piece of cake. Easy stuff, we'll just breeze right through that, and then I'll get to the hard stuff. Well, the first thing you do in gymnastics is the cartwheel. Anybody can do a cartwheel, probably, right? You know, and it's got any kind of physical, and I'm coordinated, I'll do a cartwheel. So I'm doing cartwheels, and left and right, she's like, yeah, I don't think so. I'm like, what's wrong? She goes, you got to get your legs straight up and down. I'm like, I am straight up and down. She goes, ah, I don't think so. In my head, I'm like, this is easy. Anybody would, I mean, like, relatively speaking, it's, auto, I mean, it's like a kid's thing. Piece of cake. Nope. And I'm like, uh, she's like, your legs aren't up and down like the way they're supposed to. I'm, like, I'm not believing. I'm like, I'm doing it right. She goes, no, you're not. And then she put these, like, foam, like, pillars up. And she's doing a cartwheel between those pillars without hitting them. I couldn't do it. Finally, she's like, give me your phone. She's like videotaped me, and my legs are all like, <laughs> you know, I get upside down, and I'm like lost. I have no concept, no self-awareness as I'm flipping upside down. And I look at the video, and it's like, all right, quit. Forget it. <laughs> it's like, 
<laughs> you know, so you, you, you have this, you know, I thought for sure I could do this. I practice it. It's, I mean, so we, we think certain things about ourselves that may not be true, right? And a certain level of self-awareness that we need. So it got me really thinking in this way in terms of like experience and more and flawed thinking. And I ran across a word I really didn't know before. And the word I'm going to illustrate is um, scotoma. You know what scotoma is? Well, if you got blurry vision, you go to the eye doctor, you might know what that is. Scotoma is visually when you've got like some blind spot. Or in this case, the outer edges are blurry and the middle is clear. Or in the other way, the middle is blurry and the outside's clear. It's called scotoma. It's a visual thing. Well, as I was looking at that and realizing it, that there's a lot of us who have and have and re- maybe regularly experienced mental scotoma. Whereas like you, you, you know... You're just not clear about how you think about certain kinds of things. Or you have a blind spot, a mental blind spot about certain things. And it happens in very simple ways and very complex and even painful ways. Here, let me give you an example of a simple, like a mental scotoma. And, and, and you don't laugh too much, but um, like, give me an easy one. It's one time I'm in a, a Charlie horse. I'm uh, eating lunch, studying and writing, and Christy calls me, and I'm like, yeah, hey, what's up? She's like, and I don't even remember what it was, but something happened. She's like, you got to come home right away. Like a broken pipe or a dog got out or something. I'm like, all right, cool. So I'm talking to her, trying to figure out what it is. I'm paying my bill, and I'm like, all right, I got to go. And I'm like, ah. And she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I, I can't find my phone. She's like, what? I, I can't find my phone. I can't, I'm trying to, like, be in a hurry to go. She's like, um. And I was like, oh, stupid. You know, like, what do you mean you can't find your phone? You're talking on the phone, dummy. And you've done something. You don't laugh too much. I mean, some of you have done that, right? You lose your glasses, and where are they? They're on top of your head. You, you ever drive all the way to work one day, and you get there, and you're like, I don't remember driving that. I don't remember, like, okay. It's normal. Okay, you, you have mental scotoma. And so the, the thing is, is your brain likes to conserve energy and, and, and function efficiently. And so your brain does not process every single detail of every part of your day. That's how you can drive somewhere and get to that location because you've done it a thousand times and your brain just kind of zones out. Right? So it's a mental scotoma. Now we take that to a whole other level. There's just an idea of a psychological scotoma. Like psychologically, you're functioning like this. Like you think you have clarity, but in reality, you, you think this is normal, but the reality is you are unclear about certain things. So we have a, a mental scotoma, like you're not consciously paying attention to things, but psychological scotoma, that's a whole other story. There's a sense in which it's like this. A psychological scotoma means there is information in your experience that's inconvenient for your self-awareness. And your brain responds by turning a blind eye to that thing. So this is where this gets real. So we can laugh about losing your phone when it's in your hand or your glasses when it's on your head or having, you know, just your zone out in life like where are my keys and they're in your pocket and you can't find them. I mean, that's... Typical kind of brain activity, that's normal. But when you get into the psychological scotoma, the idea is your brain does not like contradictory information. When you believe a certain thing that doesn't match with your environment and your circumstances, your brain will do whatever it takes to ease that. We could talk about cognitive dissonance. It's a big word. But ultimately, that psychological scotoma means, here we go there, it's, it refers to a situation where there's conflict between your beliefs, opinions, and your behavior. And your brain has to, like, deal with that. And usually you have to rationalize, justify, or deny that that thing is true. There's a lot of times where you believe things that just aren't true. And anytime somebody wants to tell you otherwise, you're like, stop, I don't want to hear it. We've all done it. You know how they say hindsight is 2020, right? Because foresight never is. We all have blind spots. We all have ideas or, and we make decisions on based on inadequate information And that's what I think Paul is saying, that as a believer, spiritually, 
We don't have perfect clarity. We don't have perfect vision. And we make decisions sometimes based on what we believe to be true, even though the information in the world around us is contrary to that. So I think that as I talked about early on in verse 17, Paul is talking, it ought to engage, this, this, talking about scotoma might be a way of holding on to what Paul is trying to say. So let me go back to Ephesians 4 and show you, and in this case, I'm going to give you a different version. This is a version of, um, they call this the Passion Translation. And so again, it's where people are reading through the Greek, inter- interpreting it into an, uh, an, an English version that we understand. And the Passion Version would say verse 17 like this. Paul is writing and he says, So with the wisdom, wisdom given to me from the Lord, I say, so he, they put it really nice because it's the Passion Version. Like before he's like, I order you or I urge you. He softened it a little bit. I'm just telling you, listen, don't live like the unbelievers who walk around in their empty delusions. People do what they do and believe what they believe for a variety of different reasons. But you, as a believer, have access to more in order to make decisions and deciding how to live. We have access to universal truth. The kinds of things that have been true for a thousand years and will be true for a thousand years regardless of what people's opinions are. So we are a different kind of people. Paul is saying, don't live like everybody else. Hindsight's 2020, but you know what? God has perfect vision. And he wants to provide to you out of his glorious unlimited resources truth to help you so that you can begin to experience more. He goes on to say, those unbelievers, their, their logic is corrupted and been clouded. How's that fit for the word scotoma? Clouded thinking because their hearts are far from God. They're blinded by their understanding. And deep-seated moral darkness keeps them from, from the truth of the knowledge of God. So that's the way the secular world works. But for you, as believers, you have access to more. And he goes on. And because of their spiritual apathy, they surrender their lives to lewdness and purity and sexual obsession. And it's like... <clears throat> Doesn't that describe a lot of the world that we see? Don't live like stupid, godless people. Just do what they do based on how they feel, regardless of what the truth is, because they're blinded. He goes, don't live like that. (coughs) But in contrast to that, that is not the way that, that is not the way of life that Christ has unfolded That's like a huge big deal within you. That if you've given your life to Christ and you have the Holy Spirit as a part of you, that God God wants to give you the direction and the wisdom you need to live differently. And by by accessing the more that's available for you. And he goes on (coughs) lastly and says this. If you have really experienced the anointed one, like if you really got it and you heard this truth, it will be seen in your life. For we know that the ultimate reality is embodied in Jesus. That he is our compass. He is our GPS. He is the one that's going to help us along the way. And so when things are falling apart in your life, it may be because you're making decisions based on some blind spots that you have. And God says, I want to give you that clarity that you need. And and I want to guide you along the way so that you can experience the more that maybe you've been missing. The question is, are you open to that? Are you inviting that? So as Paul is writing in Ephesians, in this case Ephesians 4, he mirrors some of this language in Romans 12. For instance, in Romans 12, you know, do not copy the the, the behavior and the customs of this world. Same thing he's saying in Ephesians 4, right? Let God transform you into a new person by changing how you think. Then you'll know God's will for you. GPS, he'll give you direction. And it is good and pleasing and perfect. And so he gives us these instructions. I think it's an amazing thing to consider. To to consider that that God wants more for you than maybe you want for yourself. He wants more for you than you even thought possible for yourself. He wants more for you than you can even imagine. It's exactly what he said in Ephesians 3. Um, I was watching... um, 
On Saturday, I was watching a um, documentary on Zig Ziglar, this motivational speaker guy, and um, he said this. He goes, you know, you cannot consistently perform in a manner which is inconsistent with how you see yourself. And it got me to thinking that maybe one of the things that's keeping us from the, the exquisite and bountiful, abundant blessing of more that God wants for us, maybe one of the number one things that keeps us from that is, is how we see and view ourselves. And that maybe that scotoma, that, that blind spot we have is how we view ourselves. And God says, man, let me tell you, and he's been telling us, Ephesians 1, 2, and chapter 3 is all about what God has been doing for you. And sometimes we don't believe it. So I want to invite you to consider how God, how do you see yourself in contrast to how does God see you? So I'm going to give you something to reflect on. We do reflection, right? I'm going to set it up a little bit differently today, but let me just start with this. Let me ask you a question. What is one area in your life that you are least open to guidance? In other words, somebody telling you, hey, you know, that part of your life might be off track. What's the one area of your life you're, you're probably prone to saying, nah, I don't want to hear it? And why don't you want to hear it? Um, that, that psychological sacoma. In other words, when you get information that comes in, it's contradictory to what you already believe. It makes you uncomfortable. I don't want to hear that. Because your brain cannot deal with opposing ideas, two opposing ideas, and, and just sit with both of them. they got to deal with it. And so oftentimes you're like, I don't know if I want to hear that. What is that? And if you are willing to go there, that's a huge opportunity for God to transform your life. I'd love for you to reflect on that. And then, and then if you're willing to do that, ask God, say, God, show me the steps to take to heal that blind spot. And I think Paul is saying that as you go back, and I want to invite you to go back to Ephesians 4, read through that again, and let the Holy Spirit teach you some things. In fact, Ephesians 4.23 says, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes, that he has perfect vision, we have blind spots. So he says, in, Paul says in, in Ephesians 4, like he did in Romans 12, let God renew you by changing how you think. And then really strongly, he kind of leaves us with this in verse 30. And here's, the, as believers who have given ourselves to God, don't bring sorrow to God's spirit by how you live. It's pretty, that's that strong language early in verse 17. He's landing with this. Remember that God has identified you as his own and has guaranteed that you will be saved on that day of redemption. God has done, and the first three chapters of Ephesians really nails down what God has done for you. So, think about how you live. We all have these blind spots. God wants to lead us through and show us truth and give us direction. And so allow him to do a work in you. What does that mean? What does that look like? And I believe the way that you move from where you are to God's blessing and experiencing more is by saying, God, I, I submit myself to you. In fact, I'd say it this way, that the, um, at the end of what you are capable of, that's the beginning of what God is able to do. The end of your capabilities is where God begins to show you more. So God, where, am I, where do I have a blind spot? Where am I limiting myself by how I view myself and how I view you? God, how do you view me and teach me something? I think it's, it, it's an amazing opportunity to experience this. And it's hard. Because your brain wants to be efficient. Your brain wants to go with what's easy and comfortable. But man, comfortable might be the roadblock to this. So let me let you sit with this. What's one area of your life that you're least likely, you're most uncomfortable accepting some guidance on? And then say, God, show me that and, and teach me how to heal that. Make me, give me clear vision. Make me, help me to see the way you see so that I can experience more. So I'd love for you to reflect on that. So whether people are watching at home or one of our campuses or here in the room, to spend some time thinking through that and really be daring and bold and adventurous enough to, to God show me. Because in that, 
man, God can release some things and you really experience what he has in mind for you. So I'm going to let you do that. Let's just kind of reflect on it. Let's take a minute or so and uh, sit with that before you go, before you head out and just keep doing what you've been doing. Because your, your life is perfectly designed to get the results you've been getting. You're 100% able to get the results that you've been getting in life. If you want more, maybe it's here. Reflect on that and then we'll uh, wrap things up. this is new to anybody, whether they're watching here or online, I mean, we want to help you with this. And that, uh, that internal GPS of the Holy Spirit is available to anybody who asks. Scripture says if you ask, he will give. He, as you ask for direction, he will give it. If you want help, that's what we're here for. The church is a tool for you to grow. This is not the goal for people to come to church. It's a tool for you. Uh, we'd love to help you. Fill out a connection card. Come find somebody if you want. Um, that connection card is a great way to get connected. We've got a baptism, big baptism service coming up here is April 4, Easter. We can do it at any time, but Resurrection Sunday is a great time to do that. We'd love to have you. You can sign up. If you're interested in the mission trips, uh, you go onto the connection card. You can sign up through that. Um, on all of our campuses, we have the ones where you write your name of the one you're helping. And as you help them, God does a work in you. It's an amazing thing. So I want to encourage you to really believe that God has something in store for you that's more, it's better, it's good. Go get it. Go find it. And if we can help, that's why we're here. So thank you. Head back out there to the, uh, that rumble and the thunder that's out there on the road. Be careful. Love to have you back next week. Thank you. You guys have a good day.